On July 16, 1943, just four years after Bill Finger and Bob Kane's character, The Batman, debuted in Detective Comics issue 27, Columbia Pictures debuted the 15-chapter black-and-white theatrical serial series titled The Batman, or simply known today as Batman. Directed by South of the Rio Grande's Lambert Hillier, and produced by Columbia's lover of a good crime drama, Rudolph C. Flothrow, Batman's plot is a straightforward and quite simple tale of the mythologically young dynamic duo who fights a dangerous threat to protect not just their thriving metropolis, but the world, which is literally the blueprint for about 90% of the Batman stories you've read, so this doesn't really seem out of the ordinary. This simple plot to thwart the literal forces of evil, however, is an ironically grainy, low-budget, ridiculously racially insensitive black and white film serial that mixes both classic and new fixtures within Batman's then growing universe with historical relevance that would today be deemed a problematic mess. Despite the ill-fitting bat costumes and the dozens of Japanese ethnic slurs just thrown about within this dimly lit classic wonder. 1943's Batman is so important to the evolution of the Dark Knight in cinema in more ways than one. So in this Bat movie review, we will dive into Hillier's Batman, see what worked and what didn't work to present this new favorited DC character and its influence and surprising legacy for our highlighted hero. Before we jump into discussing Hillier's 1943 serial Batman, just to give you an idea of the type of themes that we will be dealing with and discussing in this video, here are the tags courtesy of Blu-ray.com that are filed under 1943's Batman. They range from tags such as superhero, World War II, racism, zombie, gangsters, self-esteem, prince, and the 40s. You guys are in for a treat. You don't understand. <laughs> While today when we go to the movies or, well, no one's going to the movies anymore, when we stream a movie in the comfort of our own home, it's just a one straightforward film. However, for these black and white serials, which were very, very popular in the 1930s and the 1940s, these 15 chapter serials were actually released weekly, with chapter one debuting on July 16th, 1943, and the last chapter, chapter 15, debuting on October 22nd, 1943. And each of these serials were between 15 and 20 minutes. And in total, if you add up all of the 15 chapters, you get 260 minutes of pure, pulp, ridiculous Batman and Robin. That is longer than all of these films featuring the Batman and more. <laughs> so to me, that's already a bonus watching this <laughs> 40s film. If you're a Batman fan, who wouldn't want to watch 260 minutes of him running around just... I'm sorry. <laughs> But just jumping right into the movie, it is fun to observe the opening credits themselves past the Columbia Pictures intro, but looking at the fact that the first thing you see is the Batman, and it's the masthead from the current comics, whether it's Detective Comics or Batman. And with this visual, you get Lee Zoller's iconic score. Dollar's compositions capture the pure pulp fiction and the allure of scrappy fights on dark rooftops wonderfully fit this imperfect first look at Batman in all of cinema. And I say this because if you didn't know, 1943's Batman is the very first time that the Dark Knight and his mythology is in cinema on the big screen ever. This is already a very important film for any Batman fan even if you aren't a fan of the very pulp detective style stories of the golden age of the Caped Crusader. The film rightfully begins by showing a stately manor that houses deep in the cavernous underground the strangely dramatic Bat's Cave 
with America's number one crime fighter, the Batman, who is played by Lewis Wilson, and he is menacingly sitting at an office desk of sorts. Now this bat's cave is literally ridiculous. If you examine just the first scene, you see a huge bat symbol that is reminiscent of the bat symbol that you see in the opening credits, but also you not only hear the flapping of huge bats, but you literally see them flapping above Batman sitting at the desk probably thinking about whose butt he is going to kick today. It is just all really dramatic. I think is perfect for just introducing this character because Batman's drama all day long. As you move along in the film, you're introduced to the Batman's young assistant, Dick Grayson, AKA Robin, who is played by Douglas Craft. Both of these heroes are described as American youth who love their country, love to fight for it, and are ready to fight to the death, which that is so effing patriotic and extra. We're gonna get into why it is so patriotic and extra, but it's fantastic. Anyway. And right from the start, the duo in the beginning already apprehend a couple of crooks and literally leave them on the corner and call the police to tell them to pick them up. Because in this movie, in these serials, literally the police are literally the trash men of criminals. Batman beats them up, ties them up, puts them on a corner somewhere, and then calls the captain, who is Captain Arnold and not Commissioner Gordon yet. We're not there yet, I know that's sad. But he calls Captain Arnold and said, hey, it's the Batman, come pick up your trash. I love that because Batman literally does this even in comics and media today. What is interesting to note is that any gangster or crook that is apprehended by the dynamic duo, they not only leave them to the police chief, but they place a bat symbol stamp on their foreheads and leave a note signed with said bat symbol. Which to me wouldn't be surprised if Zack Snyder was influenced by this in his 2016 movie Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice because Ben Affleck's Batman literally brands his bat emblem on whoever he wants to leave behind for the cop. It's just Batman showing off saying, see, I did this to you and I want you to remember it. <laughs> because Batman's always been just a little petty. <laughs> Speaking of a fighting style, Batman and Robin may not be on par with the Dark Knight in the Arkhamverse video game world, but it does have a very Batman year one feel to taking down their enemies which is very scrappy, clumsy, yet confident. And it's not just Batman's fighting style that seems very crass in a sense. It's also his interrogation style, which of course you see even now in current media. For instance, when the Batman is interrogating one of Dr. Daka's men in the Batcave, it's quite threatening. Even saying his bats flying in said cave could use a snack right about now. What were those? Just some of my bats. Hope they didn't disturb you, but you see it's nearing their feeding time. Uh, you don't mind being left here alone with them, do you? That language is not only very, very common within the golden age of Batman in the 1940s and the 1950s, but also is very reminiscent of books that you're probably reading right now that are in the modern era. But the true plot begins to unfold when Linda Page, who is played by Shirley Patterson, who also acts as a love interest for the very boring playboy Bruce Wayne, in both these serials and in the comics at the time, has a previously incarcerated Uncle Martin who gets kidnapped and caught up working with the evil scientist Dr. Daka. And one of my favorite scenes when they are first kidnapping her uncle is the fact <laughs> that when Alfred and Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson and Linda are trying to chase down the car that has the, her uncle in it, it literally changes color and becomes a completely, quote unquote, completely different car. And they have no idea where it went. They're out of sight. Release the gas and make the change. Hold everything, I'm gonna turn around. Here they come. Get out. 
even though it's the exact same model, it's the exact same car, but what sorcery. After we lose Uncle Martin because of this very mysterious disappearing car, now we travel to the foreign land of Little Tokyo where the wise government rounded up the shifty-eyed Japs. Now, that's literally a quote from the film. <laughs> this was part of a foreign land transplanted bodily to America and known as Little Tokyo. Since a wise government rounded up the shifty-eyed Japs, it has become virtually a ghost street where only one business survives, eking out a precarious existence on the dimes of curiosity seekers. I know that that sounds awful, because it is awful. There is an actual reason why there is so much racism and Japanese ethnic slurs throughout this serial series. The current year is 1943, which is smack in the middle of World War II, and apparently this film is set shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The United States is full on fighting against the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan. To show this united front, from world's finest and Batman comic books to the silver screen, both of these industries would actually join forces with the US government to visually and verbally showcase being against these foreign powers during the war. Now this is seen in different ways throughout this 15 chapter serial. The first most interesting change is that Bruce Wayne isn't just a millionaire playboy, but a contract agent for the US government and completes assignments for Uncle Sam. Enemy has knowledge of construction of new design airplane motor at Lockwood. May attempt sabotage. Take necessary action to forestall any such move. Your first special assignment from Washington. That's right. And there'll be two new men by the name of Bruce and Dick working at Lockwood tomorrow. Like I said, we are trying to be just straight up America with the Batmans in this. Like, it is just outrageous. Of course you see this racism in the evil Dr. Daka's overly racist persona. I am Dr. Daka, humble servant of His Majesty Hirohito. Heavenly ruler and prince of the rising sun. What I personally think is the most interesting part of trying to show the evil of the Axis powers during this time is there is a literal like sideshow attraction called the Japanese Cave of Horrors where there is a man literally trying to rally people to come to this kind of mine ride. If you've been to Knott's Berry Farm and you've gone on like the coal mine ride, that's literally what this is, but it's just full of racist propaganda. <laughs> and all you need is 10 cents to go ride and see this racist propaganda. The ride itself actually exploits anti-Japanese imagery and ethnic slurs and uses it as promotion to showcase how the Japanese are against democracy within the United States. Now of course in a hidden pocket within the Japanese cave of horrors is Dr. Daka's evil lair and laboratory, which is where you learn of Dr. Daka's ultimate plans and in his own words by divine destiny my country shall destroy the democratic forces of evil in the United States to make way for the new order an order that will bring about the liberation of the enslaved people of America Dr. Daka's ultimate goal is to steal all of the radium in Gotham much of it at the Gotham City Foundation where Linda Page works in order to power his super ray gun that can obliterate anything in its path from objects to even humans. But in order for Dr. Daka to successfully do this plan, he is using these American scientists and doctors and making them into, that's right, zombies. <laughs> Dr. Daka actually makes men into zombies that he can control through a control hookup between the man's brain and spine, which results in them obeying Dr. Daka's orders by force. When men, such as Linda's uncle, don't comply to being Daka's henchmen, in particular due to his ethnicity, he will then take them to his electric laboratory dungeon and torture them and transform them into mindless goons. There is one part in this movie that's just extra dark when Batman is fighting on the rooftop against one of Daka's zombies and Daka orders this man to jump off the roof killing himself. Head and leave the roof. Head and leave the 
Chicago. I just personally love the fact that the very first time Batman is in cinema, we got zombies in here. We are already out here with just madness. Just madness. As the chapters continue, the dynamic duo of Batman and Robin continue to fight Dr. Daka's zombies in somewhat lit alleys, on high rooftops, on moving trains, and seemingly in different parts of this Chicago-inspired metropolis. Which leads to saving a drugged and kidnapped Linda and her uncle on multiple multiple occasions and ultimately facing Dr. Daka in the end. And because Batman and Robin are America's number one crime fighting team and we love America so much that we have to literally destroy this ultimate threat to America, this threat, this Axis power threat. The trio fight and it all leads to Dr. Daka's demise by being eaten by his own crocodiles in his secret evil lair. Which I personally think is a great way that Dr. Daka got taken out because there is a part in the movie where Dr. Daka is feeding the crocodiles but runs out of the food that he gives them and literally wants to put one of his zombie men into the crocodile pit because they're still hungry. Like he has no regard for human life at all. So he really did need to be taken out. He did. While there is a lot going on in this 260 minute <laughs> Batman serial film, I honestly think a lot of people believe that because it is such an early interpretation of Batman that he doesn't represent what the character is or the character's foundation. To those people, I would say, no fam. This movie is important for many, many reasons, especially in establishing many parts of Batman's mythology that you love and celebrate today. And the biggest one is, of course, the Bat's Cave. As you see throughout the serials, the Bat's Cave is used for not only sitting solemnly thinking about this vigilante lifestyle. We interrogate bad guys here and have a low-tech laboratory inside. This bat's cave may be crude in comparison to the now illustrious interpretations over the last several decades of Batman's secret underground caverns, but this is the first time Batman's lair that houses things from his trophies to even the Batmobile was actually called the Batcave. Batman co-creator Bob Kane was actually on this film set and after telling Batman co-creator Bill Finger about the Bat's Cave, Finger decided to make a rendering of the details within the Batman secret lair in popular mechanics which was then transferred into the Batman comic strips called the Batman Dailies. The Batcave was then first seen in a comic strip on October 29th 1943 and debuted for the first time in a Batman comic book in January of 1944's Detective Comics issue 83. Speaking of the Batcave, another addition to Batman's mythology is the grandfather clock entrance. Depending on what type of Batman media you're watching, there are different ways that Batman, Robin, Alfred, and any and all of the Batman family can enter the Batcave. But one that is probably the most well known and popular is through the grandfather clock in Wayne Manor. This concept was first seen in 1943's Batman and then was transferred over into Batman comic. Another one is one of the many bright spots within this 15 chapter black and white serial series and that is Alfred Pennyworth. Since the producers of the serials wanted the audience to be familiar with Alfred before seeing their film, Don Cameron, Bob Kane, and Jerry Robinson introduced Alfred for the first time in 1943's Batman issue 16, just months before the film's release. This is actually not a very uncommon tactic to do. You even saw this during the Batman 1966 series where Yvonne Craig, who would portray Barbara Gordon aka Batgirl, was first introduced in Detective Comics issue 359, months before her actual debut on the Batman 66 TV series. But in the first story that Alfred is introduced, which is called Here Comes Alfred, his last name initially being Beagle, 
showed him as a trustworthy, short, and quite heavy set English gentleman who accidentally discovered Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson's greatest secret as being the dynamic duo of Gotham City. Alfred's popularity would grow tremendously courtesy of 1943's Batman and would also be the big reason why Alfred's visual and persona was radically changed from the comics. Looks wise, actor William Austin's Alfred Pennyworth had the English background but was a tall, thin man with hair, acting as not just a butler and chauffeur, but the major comic relief that proved to bring great balance to a rather dark serial series. Because of this major influence, Alfred Pennyworth would debut in January 1944's Detective Comics issue 83. It would be the exact same book that the Batcave originally debuted as well. One of the best influences that I personally really appreciate from the serials and attached to Alfred and his personality is the fact that throughout the serials, especially in the beginning, you see that Alfred loves to read mystery and detective novels, which you can first see on the splash page in the story Here Comes Alfred in Batman number 16. But this would actually inspire the golden age treasures of the side stories in Detective Comics and Batman called The Adventures of Alfred. And these short stories lasted for 13 issues beginning in Batman number 22. Pennyworth becomes inspired by Master Bruce's secret life as a crime fighter and takes up his own detective work in these short but fun anecdotes that would bleed over into Pennyworth's persona over the next 75 plus years. The next major piece of Batman iconography that we just have to discuss is their Batmobile. <laughs> in comparison to the other Batmobiles seen on the big and small screen and even in comics, it pales in comparison to the extravagance of this piece of Batman's mythology. 1943's Batman being a low budget project, the costumes and set designs were less than whimsical in comparison to Bill Finger and Bob Kane's Pulp Fiction Detective Comics and Batman publications. This included the Dark Knight's Batmobile, which didn't have the special bat grill or large tail fins typically seen in the comics at the time. This Batmobile was actually a 1939 Cadillac series 75 convertible. This was used for the series and similar to early Batman stories, this same car was used for both Bruce Wayne's use and the Batman's use. In the film, when the convertible top was down, it was Wayne's luxury car. And when the top was up, it was the vehicle of the caped crusader. Come on, I have an idea that Batman should look into this. And don't forget Robin. Alfred, drive into that alley and put the top up. Yes, sir. of the very low budget set designs and bat costumes, you can clearly see that the cowl that Lewis Wilson's Batman wears kind of droops over his face, isn't form fitting as you can see in other versions of the cowl, especially on the big screen. The bat chest emblem is a rather crude interpretation of the Batman symbol that you can see in the comics. And because of that, it actually matches very well with how we see the Dark Knight in any format at this time. But what I do love is the fact that the utility belt literally is just a belt. They never really use it. It is not as functional as a utility belt would be. It's really just for show. All of these things from the Batcave to the grandfather clock to the interpretation of the good old Alfred Pennyworth to the Batmobile to even the look of the Chicago inspired Gotham City and the aesthetic of Batman and Robin themselves from their actual costume design to their personas and personalities. It all does bring to life the Batman stories that became very popular over the last four years since the character debuted in 1939. While you can just chalk this movie up as 
a very crude way of showing the dynamic duo having to fight an evil Japanese scientist in the heat of World War II who was unleashing mind-controlling zombies to subjugate Japanese rule over the United States. Isn't that just a plot like? <laughs> 1940s Batman did way more than just be racially insensitive and feel like a home movie of sorts which I find hilarious because before Columbia Pictures put this movie out, they chalked it up as one of their biggest film serial productions to date. So this was the cream of the crop in 1943 for serials. It's not just one of the biggest productions that Columbia Pictures did at the time, but it became so popular that in 1949, another 15 chapter Batman serial was released called Batman and Robin, and it starred a different dynamic duo, with our next Dark Knight being Robert Lorre. As I've discussed actually in a recent video where I highlight how the Nolanverse and not necessarily the Burton verse, discredited the camp of Batman. Going into the 1960s, these black and white serials became extremely popular once again on college campuses to even huge Hollywood parties. And because these serials were seen as practically hilarious because let's face it, they are a little funny. It was decided at that time, in particular from executives at ABC, that they should take these serials and make a parody of sorts from the 1943 and 1949 big screen versions of Batman, which resulted in the 1966 TV series Batman starring Adam West and Burt Ward as this new dynamic duo. If you want to just cast off 1943's Batman as just not an authentic interpretation of the Cape Crusader that you know and love, I would strongly suggest that you check it out and see how much this movie has influenced what we do enjoy in all visual media involving the Cape Crusader. Is it on a particular streaming service right now? No. Maybe it'll go on HBO Max or something of that sort in the future, but you can buy both the 1943 and 1949 Batman black and white serials on Blu-ray. I, I watched this film probably about three times in preparation for this video and it was just a blast. I'm not even gonna lie. Is the racism bad? Of course it is. Knowing the historic context of it all and knowing that we are just America right now because we were smack dab in the middle of World War II and tying that history to Batman's history is literally so important and the reason why I started History of the Batman in the first place is to see how this fictional DC character is influenced by the outside world and what's going on. And that is literally what 1943's Batman does. It places this mythology, both the already established and new features, and puts it in what our real world was facing at the time to make a brand new story not seen in common. I do recommend you watching this hot ass mess <laughs> of Hillier's 1943-15 chapter serial, Batman. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching this Bat movie review of 1943's Batman. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a bat, a bat, a bat, thumbs up, as always, all of my social media is linked in the description below, including Instagram at History of the Batman. So why don't you go to follow and become a Gothamite? Check out the rest of my Batman videos on this channel. And of course, please subscribe to this channel so you can become part of this Batman community. It would mean so much to me. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will have much more History of the Batman soon, right here on YouTube. Remember, Gothamites, all about peace, love, and Batman. Bye. What? <laughs>